Good afternoon, and thank you for joining me for the first Black Women in Politics and Your Discussion. My name is Monet Holden. I'm the North Florida Regional Director. And as part of New FM, we are hosting this conversation to explore the, the Black Women in Politics, the challenges that they face, and have had to overcome the resources needed to both recruit and elect Black women in politics. So I am joined here today by some amazing women who come out of the political community and will have the opportunity to talk more with them about this topic, about being a black woman in politics, especially in the state of Florida. So right here in the room with me, we have State Representative Chase Davis, who's representing House District 13 in Jacksonville, Florida. And we also have Francesca Mack, who's the Florida State Coordinator at the department. So welcome, ladies, and thank you for being here. But David, I know you just came out of the Florida Legislative Session. So welcome. Thank you. And I actually, you know, want to start with you, but thank you, if you don't mind. <laughs> you know, ask you more about how did you become a state representative? Like, what was your journey to that position in office? What is life working at that level? And if you can just talk a little bit more about some of the challenges and opportunities for a black woman in that office, both in a local and state context. A lot I know that's a lot. Another question. No, of course. So let's just start with, you know, how'd you get to how did you get to where you are right now? Um, th that was an interesting journey, if I have to say so myself. So I was a teacher, I was a special education teacher with Duwan County for seven years, and that was me. I went over to the supervisor elections office here in Duval County and was there from 2001 to 2015. In between that time, while I was there. I actually ran for supervisor elections, um, lost that race, and then left the office but went back to work for the city of Jacksonville. Um, and this opportunity for a state representative, um, <clears throat> it came up. So while I was running for supervisor elections, I realized at that time that that was the way I felt the passion and commitment and how I wanted to serve. Um, my community and, and felt that I could get some real good things accomplished in that manner. And so the opportunity for the state representative seat came available. Um, lost that first race to on an, a well-liked incumbent. And let's just say that he was very well-liked, um, still is, um, really good guy. And lost that race by 400 votes and was nominated um, once his situation went a uh, different way was nominated to replace him on the ballot. And so, um, as they say, and that's how we're here today. I won that race and um, have been serving in, in this position since November 2016. I think that was the entire journey. That was the entire journey. So through that journey, though, even um, as in, in the supervisors of elections office and running those races and your time thus far in the Florida House, what were some kind of current like challenges and opportunities that you've seen thus far? Especially for black women. Well, you know, when you're talking about challenges, and I think for running races or just deciding to run, period, um, the challenges I faced personally, number one, was being a woman. Um, but I just think being a candidate coming out of uh, the elections office, and surprisingly so, um, had been there for 14 years, but no name recognition. And that, that's huge in a community of our size, but just in a you know, running races today, period. Um, people recognize you by having a name in the community doing things. And, and you know, I, I conducted elections for 14 years, but I was behind the scenes all that time. So even though I was, you know, making elections happen for over a half a million people, um, no one knew the name Tracy Davis. So once um, you have, that's the first obstacle. And then the second obstacle is no name recognition toppled with the fact of, now you have to raise money to run a, a race and get your message out that, hey, I'm the best candidate. So name recognition, um, money and being able to raise it, being able to connect with the heavy hitters, not having a name recognition, it, it all, you know, is all in the same ball of wax. So it's very difficult without that name ID and the ability to raise um, good money to get your message out there. And thank you for that. Some of the things that you mentioned are stuff that we're going to dig into later on in the conversation. So that's perfect. And FYI, I need your name. Okay. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, did the I, did. All the time. I did. I did. I did. 
But before we um, talk a little bit more about um, Francesca's journey, I want to introduce Miss Jessica Bird. She is the founder and chief doer at Three Point Strategies, which is an electoral strategy firm. Welcome and thank you for joining us, Jessica. Hey. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. Um, and happy Women's History Month to all of you, um, you know, trailblazers. Um, and so do you want me to do a quick intro? I would say yes, perfect. I was going to say, while we have you um, speaking now, if you could talk to us a little bit more about yourself um, and the work that you do and kind of just dis discuss your story, like how you got to um, building out strategies for electoral politics. Awesome. Awesome. Um, well, I love Florida New Majority, so thank you for all the work that you all are doing. Um, my name is Jessica Bird, to everyone out there. Um, I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. Um, my dad was actually born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida, so I still have family in Florida who I love very deeply, and some of them might be on this call. Um, and, you know, I became addicted to elections when I was a kid because my mom was a poll worker. Um, and so she literally became a poll worker uh, to make a little bit of extra money and eventually became like the voting lady in our community and so we would be in the grocery store and my mom would be asked would be asked like I'm not registered what should I do you know I didn't vote this time Miss Bird I'm really sorry you know and I really felt like even though we were this like kind of working poor family that lived in a in a black neighborhood that she was given this respect and so I really followed this concept that people who were engaged in the process got a little bit of respect and of course as I continued to work on campaigns I I started to learn exactly what that was and some of the complexities of it but I really pursued politics as an opportunity to make my family's voice heard um, and so I joined my first campaign when I was 15 I got positively addicted uh, to the idea that you could talk to all of your community and potentially win something. Um, and so I've worked on campaigns in 43 states across the country. I spent a little over four years at Emily's List, where I led the first candidate recruitment program specifically focused on recruiting women of color. And, you know, I really loved uh, working on campaigns every day and especially working with women of color and black women. And in 2014, really, my life really changed after the murder of Michael Brown. Uh, and I started to really think of myself as a person who not only wanted to win elections for election's sake, but as a person who wanted to contribute meaningfully to a movement. And so I started to ask myself some really important questions about what it would look like to be contributing to a movement that was really shaking up the world. And so um, as I was looking around, I, I felt like there was a void in the bridge between movement and electoral work, which, which was this thing that I was mastering. And so um, I struck out on my own. And what started three years ago as just an opportunity for me to, you know, figure out if movement politics was a possibility has now grown into a five person firm. Um, I'm so thankful to lead five black women who every single day wake up to not only serve black people, but to elect black women. And um, we are only growing and I'm excited to tell you more about what we're working on. Policy and of course voter activation through electoral strategies and just turning folks out to vote. So to hear that, it's always so refreshing. And also to hear your story about your mom, because often when people think of women in politics, it's either you're running for office or you're not. But knowing that it is those other positions, whether it's your local poll worker, your supervisor of elections, or people building out the strategies that women can actually be impactful to make um, political change. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's Francesca. I would like for you to tell us how you got into politics. I know your story, uh, <laughs> but many people don't. It's a great one. Tell us both from your experience in the policy and advocacy side, running for office, now working with elected officials. Talk to okay. Um. Well. <laughs> um. Politics was something I definitely didn't really think I would get into because um, I come from a Haitian family and politics is synonymous with danger, losing your life. And so when I started school and I started as a biology major and switched over to political science, it was a very hard conversation to have with my mother. 
um, who was very distraught, who was very disappointed because that was the path that I chose. And um, as I got more and more involved in politics, which I always already had some kind of um, introduction to it because I was a high school debater. And so policy topics, that was something I was already engaged in and aware of. And so when I decided to get involved in politics, I was very active on campus. I was an active student organizer. I was part of that group of feminists on campus that was always trying to make noise and hold people accountable, including our university president at the time, who was just making people's lives miserable. And so once I graduated and I plugged into public allies and just basically doing public service and understanding that there was a broader realm of work that I could engage in. And so I've been involved in the Young Democrats of Miami-Dade County for almost eight years, um, rising to like being one of the vice presidents. Um, I got engaged into different county boards. Um, several county commissioners gave me those opportunities to serve as their appointees, um, from Commissioner Monestine to Sally Heyman. Um, being exposed to Commissioner Levine and the role that she played as the executive director of Catalyst Miami. Um, I just had a lot of exposure. Um, and so when I decided to run, it was kind of frightening um, because it was more of my community asking me and me know knowing that if I wasn't supported, I would never have ran. And that's what basically kind of like triggered me and kind of like catapulted into running because I knew I had a very strong support system. And although like my first run in 2016, I did lose by about 279 votes. And that's like that number that's always going to be ingrained of like 279, 279. Um, but it was partly because it was a very saturated race. Um, unfortunately, and um, name had to do with it. And so what the representative was talking about around name recognition, because although I did have name recognition in my community, um, there was someone's last name who had more recognition in the community. And so that's where the votes went. And I know that even after I lost, I didn't disappear, you know? And so from that election, I ended up being elected as state committee woman for um, Miami-Dade County Democratic Executive Committee. And now I'm the treasurer of the Florida Democratic Party. About the work you do. You're not focused in Miami-Dade County. And as you can do Duval County, now that the politics are a little bit different yeah. than in other places in the state, can you speak to that? Like, what is the need as far navigating about the state and or in other um in other states when it comes to politics and something that we learn from and that we should try to put forth some change. Wow. So I think all of us here dealing in politics know that there are losses and wins, some of which you know, we're sharing on this, this chat so far, but what do you see as making a difference? I heard twice name so that's true. Um, but outside of that, what makes the difference for Black women when it comes to um, mm -hmm. recruiting and women? Mm -hmm. She's nodding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry with you, our chief strategist over here. Yeah. Um, can you hear me? So, you know, I think this is, this is really complicated because I think that there are very specific kind of micro things that exist for what which would make it easier for the candidate. Right. So, you know, we heard, um, Rep Davis talk about like name recognition would have cleared the path a little better. Um, you know, having people just believe in her from the beginning and not, not. Right? And then I also think that there are also these like macro things that are that black women candidates are experiencing all over the country, which is um, one, that there is a belief for some reason that black women are not viable, that that is somehow a um, almost like always a, um, a wild card choice 
when in many places, um, Black women are the leaders in their communities in really non-traditional, non-elected ways already. And so we're seeing that, you know, even in, in, in places where people have served for, for decades, there somehow seems to be like, oh my gosh, we're going to take a risk on this Black woman who's running for office. And so I do think that there's a, there's a lack of trust and understanding of how, um, you know, Black women's leadership can look when they're running for office. Um, I would also say fundraising and not just fundraising in, um, you know, that the literal calling and asking people for money, which we know is really kind of outside of our comfort zone. You know, we're not, we're taught not to ask people for money. And then you literally have to turn on this candidate switch and start to start to do that. But also, um, you know, mainstream, and I would even go as far as to say DC folks really believe that money is the greatest way to tell if a candidate is viable or good. And and I would argue as a person who works with people who are being completely outspent by millions of dollars and winning, that, you know, Black women really have this very unique ability to build a people-powered, community-driven campaign. And while how, while having competitive resources is always really nice and can make it a little easier, it is not the end all be all. And so, you know, I think that um, not only does there need to be, you know, a clear path to elected leadership for Black women, I think we need to change the culture at which we understand a person should run for office. Um, I mean, and I would add to that that um, I think I, I don't. I didn't have that experience because again, it's like I actually had the community coming out and supporting me and um, basically every endorsement I could have gotten, I did. Um, I had about almost 30 endorsements, teachers, labor, social organizations, cultural organizations, um, minus the person who basically leveraged his family's wealth, I outraised everyone. And that was with people who were giving their last dime to make sure that they were showing that they were supporting someone that they actually truly believed in, that they saw grow, um, you know, as they worked in the community. And so I had over 400 donors um, within a span of about five and a half months. And so part of what I feel is just um, us being able to kind of get out of that fear of that we're not worthy because that's where I was. I was in that place of, I don't care how many times you all have asked me to run. I don't think I want to run. And I don't think that I'm good enough to run. Mind you, I had been in this landscape where I had been working in Tallahassee at that time, probably for about five or six years. I had been in that capital, stopping bad bills, working with coalitions, pushing good bills. And I still didn't think that I was worthy enough to be in that seat. And here I had all of this community support swarming around me and saying that we will protect you, we will guard you, we will hold you up. We just need you to believe in your own potential. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess I'll jump in. Yes. <laughs> Definitely a combination of what Fran and Jessica said, um, both, and I agree with both of the ladies. Um, and I think for my situation was kind of similar a little bit to Fran in a sense of, I, it was my journey. It was my journey to why I made the decision. Um, and it, it was, I had been in this office uh, working as a deputy supervisor and as an elected official for a number of years in my first race. And I said, you know, if anyone's gonna do this and take over, it should be me and it can be me. So it definitely was me making up my mind to walk that journey. But the other thing was having the strong support system of community people and other black women that looked like me to say, yes, you can do this and we're with you. And so it, it was that strong um, support system along with, and I think coming from the elections office, your attraction to the community and the community's attraction to you. Because we, we're get, we get the question all the time in the from the elections office, well, what, we can, what can we do to make voters come out? And there's nothing an elections office can do. It's voters are attracted to the candidate that they have in front of them. Voters support that candidate. They follow the candidate. But it's all about that candidate and the attraction that that person causes for them. So um, well said, ladies. And I just wanted to, to add that little piece to it. It definitely is about a strong um, support system and the voters 
the candidates appeal to the voters. Mm -hmm. So I know us, like those of us who are behind the scenes, we're looking at the data, you know, numbers, and it's how we can start with viability, polling, all of that stuff. But then there's also just part of being running during a time of a movement or a wave, right? So we saw that um, with President Obama, and that was a movement for black people because we had a black candidate and saw that both times. Now, um, based on the political climate, there is a, a greater movement, right, for us to be both stable and really um, show our strength politically. So how, how much does that matter? Those are, those are two, like, big ones. But there are other pivotal points throughout in which they can be next to key points for candidates, especially if you may not feel confident or women candidates. Um, how much of that actually matters or how much of doesn't when you talk about a wave or movement. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. sure the next one, I'm going to let somebody else go first. I promise. No problem. No, I think it's everything. I think it's everything. And I think, um, you know, as we as we heard, our connection to the community, in my opinion, and the way that Three, three Point Strategies is ex exists in the space is absolutely pivotal. Um, what we're experiencing right now is that people are ready to um, go to the ballot box and to make a statement about the current state of affairs, not just not just in our states, but nationally. And, you know, are ready to engage in a way that demonstrates that um, they want to protect their communities and they want to fight back and they want to resist a, a, a growing political climate that feels ugly and full of scandals and also full, full of harmful legislation. And so, you know, we are seeing people able to win across the country in ways that we have not seen in, in many, many years. And so what I would say to that, though, is not only do should we engage in this election in the belief that anything is possible, we can win in ways that we don't even realize because of the energy of the people and because people's drive to fight back. But once we do elect the people that we that we voted for, and once we do feel like at least we're making progress back to um, to the place you know where where we feel like those people love our communities and want to fight for us, we can't let up. Our job as people, our job as movement, is to not only hold folks accountable to but to continue dreaming, saying I don't just want to exist in this election to be in opposition to someone. I want to build the world and the and the elected leadership um, positions that I think actually are transformative. And so, to not only use this election as as a fight back moment, but to also use it as the foundation for what we're trying to build. And um, you know, when I'm dreaming with 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 black women candidates uh, I'm often like if if we weren't even in this climate what would you have done because so much of what we can do um, is possible yeah and I would add on to that that so my my job and I'm always very honored to be in this position um, because I'm the Florida State coordinator for local progress and so this is a national network of local elected officials, progressive local elected officials who are trying to make impact in their community. And so partly around what Jessica just said is like, you know, let's not just look at the election. Let's just not look at the victory, but what does that look like after? What is the support that we are providing to our community? Because that's sometimes where people feel that we dropped the ball with Obama. We feel that we elected him. We wanted him to be our savior, the end all be all, but our communities weren't present to hold him accountable. And so what does that look like when we worked very hard to elect people and then kind of leave them in the wind once they're elected? And so that's part of like what local progress does is that we make sure that we have a network that is supporting our local elected officials, providing them with the technical skills that they need, providing them with the research support, the calm support to actually activate them to think out of the box and push good policies for our community to be innovative, to not be afraid of pushing the envelope when it comes to the policies that we want to work on to ensure that our communities are sustainable, are sufficient, are effective in what they need. And so with Black women, we are, again, always expected to carry the communities on our backs. 
And so it shouldn't always be only our responsibility, although it is something that's kind of like thrust upon us or is expected of us. And so I'm very excited to see this blue wave and to see what is that impact, you know, like benefit actually to the state of Florida will be because our, especially in our state where we're fighting back on issues of preemption, where local governments are basically being erased, their responsibilities are being erased because the state feels that they don't have the authority to protect their own communities. We need strong women. We need strong candidates to come in and actually be like, I am willing to challenge the institutions, the structures, the systems to um, ensure that our communities are safe and that they are thriving. Um, well said again, ladies. It's not too much a, a elected person can say behind um, that. The, the, but I will add when France said that as black women elected, we have to feel like, or we do feel like we are carrying the weight of the community on our shoulders. Mm -hmm. She's absolutely right. So Jessica mentioned uh, holding our elected accountable and that's exactly right too. And the combination is making sure once you all have done the grassroots and the strategies to get us elected as um, women of color, that we are held accountable. But we're held accountable in the sense to our community, and we're held accountable in the sense of it is now our responsibility to ensure and help you continue the election of more African American um, women. That is our responsibility. So with everything, we, we have to know that being elected um, some of that responsibility is what we are to do for the community, and that is to enlist and uplift and empower, but it's also our responsibility to continue what you have started with us. Mm -hmm. elect, continue to elect more Black women. Mm -hmm. And can I jump back in? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I love this because I often think, you know, when I was when I was purely like in a big Democratic pack and was doing electoral politics, I often felt guilty. Like for some reason that took away from my ability to be like an activist that people respected. And as I've as I've moved really comfortably into a space where I can exist in both equally is I really think that we think that that folks who move into a chamber or who get elected, all of a sudden, all of their values go away. And I think that we should get to a place where we're all on assignment in our lives, all of us. And when I was in that big pack, I was on assignment for my for my family, for my community. And I, I was there to learn and to understand and to grow my skills and then to be able to really live in radical ways based on some of the things that I was learning. And I so many of the women that we've worked with, when they get elected, they're then on assignment for and they're they don't take off their activist hat. They're activists elected leaders. And so I oftentimes think that we should complicate, right, our ability that somehow they leave something at the door. I don't think that that's necessarily true. And I think as activists, we can do, you know, even more to be like, that's my person. And when you do something tough in that chamber, when you take a risk, you're going to return to us because you've been on assignment and we love you and we got you. It's oftentimes that people lack courage in elected leadership because they're not returning to people. And so, you know, I always let, as we're building movement and we're working in electoral politics to be like, they can return to us. Like when they make bold decisions, we got their back. Well, that was actually, love, love. yeah, just to actually love, love. answer my mm -hmm. next question I was gonna ask. So I feel a lot of um, sense of, deep passion for community from all of you and wondering how, and this could be specifically for Representative Davis, how that creates challenges um, being in elected office. Because you, you haven't taken up the activist hat, I can say that. Um, you recognize the responsibility not just to your district, but to Florida. But how does that present a challenge when you're trying to get things done, when you're trying to still wear your legislator hat? I don't, I don't know if you look at it as, as challenges. I think everything we do to a certain point would um, create obstacles for us. But I think once you're elected, you, you are supported by your community. 
the fight never stops for them. You, you know the platform that you were elected on, you fight for that platform, but you know, once you begin to fly, fight for a platform, it's not, it, it doesn't stop at your community, it stops throughout the state, throughout the country. So um, I don't really kind of deal with it or look at it as an obstacle or a challenge. It's just a fight ahead. I have uh, children and I know um, before I was elected, I had thoughts of how I wanted this community in this state, in this world to um, treat my children and others' children and the children of the state and country. And so I fight for them. I fight for our elderly. I fight for um, to wrong whatever I see is right. So not to be having a political speech here, but the, the, the fight is just the fight. And, and whatever it is, um, I was elected to stand up and be the voice. So it is just a continuance every day. So we went through the hard stuff. I have easy questions for you. Um, what do women, especially black women, who want to run to the office? What are things that they should be considered in knowing or deciding if they're worthy of the time? Um, just step one in making that decision. And then the same for women who do not want to hold elected office, but do you want to be involved in um I, I think first of all the decision has to be made decision um the confident um assured decision that this is the journey you want to take because it, it truly is a journey and i mean we talked about a lot of things but it's a different kind of journey as a woman um, running for office. Um, we have family, we're usually the providers of our family when we have children. We usually are the, the primary caretaker um, for our children. So as a woman, you think of a lot of different things. And, and then as a, a woman of color, it's, you know, two, two person income household, one person, um, how are we gonna do this if the money is different? Um, I, I like to joke with people when they look at some of the elected offices, you, you have to really know how much we get paid. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> because when you see the, the annual salary, you'll realize that most most of us are doing this for the passion and the mm -hmm. and the dedication to community because it is not about salary. Um, mine specifically at less than $30,000, but it, it, there's a lot of things going on. So it definitely is a journey. I am a married person, so it's a decision that you cannot make alone because this is um, a journey for the family. It's a journey for everyone involved in your support system. Um, and so you have to make this decision with that support system in, in mind. And I'll, I'll tell you, as a married person, this is not an easy life um, being in an elected person. Um, and I, I know my, my strategists probably kind of feel the same way with their jobs and how much of a toll that this particular life takes over your personal life. And so I, those are some really serious decisions that any woman, um, but especially a woman of color, has to make. Yeah. So, but again, when that, that decision is made, then it's a journey of creating a support system of, of women that look like you and, and then just being able to, to walk the journey. Yeah. And I can definitely say that. Um, <laughs> so when I ran in 2016, I was actually the youngest black woman running in a state house seat, in a state, state legislature period. And so, you know, like, I understand the privilege that I had because I'm not married. I do not have children. And so the decision was relatively, once I kind of got over the hurdle of my fear, my insecurities, my hesitations around whether or not I was worthy for this seat, it became relatively easy, you know, but of course, you know, being 30, you have student debt, you have things that you also have to deal with. And it's like, how can I step away from my job where I have to pay bills and I have my student debt? and not feel that 
I'm giving up a lot of me um, for like what representative um, David said, like around you're only making 30K a year. So that's actually a, a huge pay cut. And so again, you remind yourself, it's like you're doing this for your community at the end of the day. People need proper representation because unfortunately many people walk into these positions not prepared. They spend most of their term just trying to even understand what their roles and their responsibilities are. And so the fact that I had been in the Capitol for about six years prior to that, I knew that alongside all of the other people that I was running against, I was one of the most qualified people for that position. And um, it was long days, long nights, no weekends to myself. I gave up weekends for a couple of months because it's like you had to put this as priority and you had to be in spaces for people to know who you were and why you were running. And so um, it was definitely an incredible experience because through that I gained a lot of relationships with people that I probably would have never come in contact with. And thankfully, I'm not one of those people that just kind of run and disappears because I lost because I know I'm embedded and I'm entrenched and I know my responsibility to my community. And so I've been able to maintain those relationships and support people in the ways that they need to be supported, that they may not be supported right now because they don't know how to navigate um, the systems, whether it's local, federal or state and knowing that you still have a role to play whether you win or lose. And it's and that's what's gonna actually show the community how, com how committed you really are. Like, are you actually gonna be here the day after the election because you didn't win? Yeah, yeah and I just wanna jump in because those answers were so great. Is just, if for anyone who's thinking about running right now where you are, um, oftentimes uh, folks say that the reason that women run for office um, is because they're, they're mad as hell or they want to fix something. And that often means, though, is that we've been frustrated about something, we haven't been getting an answer, and then we decide to run like three months later. And so for, for when that could happen to you, um, my advice is to create a folder on your computer. I used to say put a box in like your office or you know your room, your bedroom that you would have to trip over. But since we're in the age of digital, take a a folder on your desktop and say, you know, my eventual running for office folder. And what I want you to start doing is to use it as almost a campaign in a folder. So if there's a great article about you that you love, if there's an article that pisses you off, if there is a list of contacts from an amazing training that you did where you know that every single one of those people would be so joyful that you are running, put that in that folder. And then what I want you to do is I want to take you to your cell phone and I want you to upload it into an Excel spreadsheet. This is usually pretty easy. You can do this on like your Apple, like, you know, desktop situation. And I want you to start to think of that as your army. A lot of us, we have 500 to 1,000 contacts in our cell phone. And if you texted any one of those people, they would be happy to hear that you are running for office. And so start to really think of that as a database eventually. Say you never run for office, no problem. When you become the ED of an organization, when you build a campaign to win something in your community, you still need that, that, that army of people. And so start now. There are ways to start getting organized and to start doing research, even if you're not going to run tomorrow, this year, or in 2020. Um, lastly, create a document. And as laws change in your area about running for office, filing, as um, your campaign finance laws change, they change intentionally to keep us confused. So write those down so that then when you come back to it, that you know that you need a certain amount of signatures, that you know how much money you need to file. Those types of things that are just the boring admin stuff get started now and to be honest you can do it on a night watching scandal just doing a little research um so that then you you start to understand what you're getting yourself into yeah. and um i heard fundraising mentioned earlier in the conversation so how do we overcome the fear of asking people for money, especially if we ourselves don't have money? You know, there's a lot of people who fund their own campaigns and you know, they have a big circle of large donors. But with that contact list, how do we feel comfortable saying, hey, 
um, I need five dollars. I need twenty five. I need a hundred dollars. What are some tips um, you guys can share about that? Okay, so I'll be the first one. <laughs> um, with five dollars and ten dollars and things like that, um, we, we do think that this is strategy. So the ladies really need to be given strategy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm elected. I'm telling some of my secrets. But we um, get a little envelope with a disclaimer on. And so when we're places or we throw a little small community um, fundraiser or we're going places, we ask people for small donations. And we may do things like um, donating dollars. Um, we know here in Dubai County that when folks look at your um, campaign report and you see all of these small donations of dollars, that, um, that's a signal, um, a definite signal for Support. So, getting those five or ten dollar donations, it may seem like you know a little for those people that are listening, but those donations go a really long way. So, when someone comes up to you with a small envelope, you know, give them your two dollars that you have because we need it. Um, and it goes a long way when you start reporting. Yeah, but the strategy may know something. May know other things. That was just one strategy I was willing to share. <laughs> um. <laughs> I mean, I would say for me, uh, asking for money is hard. This is hard. I mean, we're not going to pretend that it's not hard. Um, because especially when you have to go to the people that you love and you know the situations that they're in. But it's again, it's like give what you have because there's no amount that's too small. And so when I was running um, the firm that I was working with, I actually was forced and almost about two or three times a week. I had to come into the office. I had to sit down with someone and who was literally just there standing, staring at me as I made these phone calls to get out of my comfort, you know, to get out of my fear of like, I can't ask for money. And it was like, here's the list of people you're going to call today. Um, you're going to make a request of them. We're going to keep track of all these call notes and I'm just going to be here just watching you. Right. And, you know, being here available for any questions. So it's like having a buddy that can be there encouraging you when you're asking for, um, you know, for um, for fundraising and for money for your campaign can actually be really helpful um, because it's like you're not there alone and they're not the ones making the phone calls. It's you. It's just they're there kind of for like moral support. Yeah. So, uh, Fran, I'm usually that person at literally at the door, like, hello, sorry, what are you doing? Um, and so one thing is, um, it is hard. It is actually does not feel like a natural thing for many of us to do. We're the doers, we're the helpers. So asking someone to help us doesn't always feel good. Um, this is actually going to take a psychological change in your mindset. They're not helping you you are facilitating an opportunity for them to transform their community. And who wouldn't want that opportunity? And we make oftentimes, and this is a, this is a black girl thing for all, for all my black women, we make a lot of assumptions about other people's stuff because we're the, we're the lovers and we're the community builders. And so we're like, you know, um, you know, Miss Betty, she told me she's excited about me running, but I don't want, you know, I know she just put her grandbaby through, through college. Miss Betty wants a new mayor. Miss Betty wants a new school board member because she just put her child through college and she knows everything about what's going on in the community and the school system. And so you just made an assumption about a, a, something that could potentially change Miss Betty's life. And I literally, I've never worked with anyone from governor, U.S. senator to town council person who has not done this and said, I can't call my brother. You know, he just put the girls through through cheerleading. Like, you got to call your brother. Your brother wants his sister to be a city council person. Are you kidding? And so um, what we got to do is to start to see ourselves as still a community person whose community has been waiting for you. And that means that that $10 that they might put aside for you and shoot. I just I, one of my first campaigns I, I worked on um, was uh, one of my best friends named Latasha Mays. She would not ask her mother for money and her mother was a retired military person and she just she was she just was making all these assumptions three days before the election day. Her mom sends us a thousand dollar check. Latasha's crying. She cannot believe it. She's like, I don't even know where this could have come from. 
it's your mama. Your mama has been figuring out. And now to be honest, and what I had to be was a tough guy to say, and we could have used that thousand dollars six months ago. And now we have it three days before the election, mama, because you weren't, you weren't facilitating, giving her the process to really engage. And so, you know, we really are going to have to start to change our mindset about this, get over the trauma of the way money has affected our lives in the past, get over the way that it makes you feel. And, and I don't mean to belittle it. Those are real. Those are real things. I feel them too, as a business owner, but imagine when you win. Imagine when you win and they get to feel like they invested in a part of their community. And so don't take that from people. Your army, this this contact list that you're going to create, they truly want to be helpful and to be supportive. And you got to do it. So I'll just add, um, I, I like the way you, you, I think Jessica said it. I'm, I'm the black girl that's a little different. <laughs> so you're right, ladies. It, it's very hard. But for me, it's, the hard part is not the front end with asking. The hard part is the follow-up for me. And um, I think Fran said she had a buddy that would make her sit, that would sit in front of her. And Jessica said she was that, yeah, she was that buddy. It's a follow-up for me. So I'll make the call. I'll ask, I'll ask for the money. Um, no problem. No matter who it is, it's the follow-up. If someone says, you know what, I don't have it right now, but give me a week or two and call me back, that callback is, is where I, I go wrong or I, I have to have someone say you need to call back um the other side of that is or the other thing i'll add is you don't have to be the person to raise all the money either yeah there's a lot of um little strategies that uh, i've used and it's inviting people in um families and family and friends are the best people to start with but give them an assignment i think it was mentioned by one of the ladies earlier we all have an assignment and and if you bring people in to help you and even help you with the small dollars of raising money it's giving them assignment as well you have a lot of things going on there they're buying in you have even more support um and they're showing the belief in you and their commitment to you for winning this race and and how much they want to be a part of this this win as well so i just wanted to add those two. <laughs> yeah because i would also say that that's what um, actually helped me in this is like I was like my mom is retired how am I gonna like ask her and she was like I'm on assignment I'm going to your to your uncle to your cousin to your sister we gonna all send you checks and you know ex you know within the next two weeks you will be getting checks and I'm gonna go back to them again and we're gonna get more checks and this is my mom who's just like retired she's just supposed to be chilling like these are her days um, and she's like, no, we're going to get the money. And I'm in Kansas City and we're just going to go around to the entire Haitian community in Kansas City and we're going to fundraise for you. You know, and my girlfriends did the same thing here in Miami. Like we had young black professional days. We have black women days. We had social justice movement days for people who are in the social justice community here. And so that's that goes to what you were saying representative is that it's not just your responsibility to raise the money but that your network actually helps you and it's almost kind of like that six degrees of separation because then they tap into their network people who may not even know you directly but because they trust this friend and they trust their opinion they actually are willing to help you and that's how i got a lot of the support that i got so i want to pivot into some questions from my viewers um, the first one that came in is how can women demand more from the Democratic Party? Who wants to take that one? I'll let one of the strategists <laughs> jump in with that one. <laughs> <laughs> <That's okay>. Um, <laughs> friend, right. I know. So, as you all may know, um, I'm the treasurer of the Florida Democratic Party. <laughs> and, um, that's kind of my constant battle and fight and with my other sisters who are um, state executive committee members who are dnc members representing florida we have this constant struggle where and i know some people in the party may be mad at me right now um we don't focus on the black community um and we have to hold ourselves accountable the community has to hold the party accountable because it's always this if you're not asking if you're not demanding of them they don't see why they should do it 
And we saw this in past elections where, you know, people flooded into the state, they prioritized certain communities, but the black community was at the lowest end. They were like the last thought, probably two, three weeks before the elections where things were getting scary is where you saw them rev up and built the capacity, unfortunately. And so we have to demand it of our party. And I'm always thankful because the first vice chair of the state party is black. I'm the treasurer, I'm black. And we're both black women. And the secretary is a black man. And so you have this representation amongst the state officers, but it's still, how does that trickle down locally? And how does that trickle down to your DECs to make sure that you have representation, you're engaged in your local Democratic Party where you're demanding it of them. Because at the end of the day, it's like, if you don't demand, there's so many things going on um, that it makes it hard for the party. Sometimes it's actually hard. Sometimes they, they just honestly don't engage. And sometimes uh, people may feel that it's intentional. Some of us have theories around that it may be intentional because we're a base vote of people. and where do the candidates ultimately come from and so you're seeing there's a lot of groups that are actually starting up where they're like we're focused on building black political power we're going to be intentional about building black political power black women power and we don't have to necessarily associate ourselves with the party in order to build that power because just like you saw with the tea party and all of my friends who know me we talk about this on a daily basis the Tea Party forced the right to be even more conservative to the fact that we have the mess that we have right now with the Republican Party, because you had people who were conservative, but then you had the completely extra, extra conservative. And so what is the wave that we're creating within the Democratic Party where we're creating a left of the left and where they will have no choice but to follow us? So everything doesn't have to happen with the, within the party, but it's about what are the things that we're creating on the outside? What is the power? What is the groundswell that's being created to actually force the party to understand the importance of black women, the role that we play in the party? Because Alabama showed it. Virginia showed it. But are they listening to the voters that show that we turned out for you and we are actually the reason why they're calling it a blue wave? You don't see that. And so it's like, what are the levels that you're creating where, yes, we are agitating within the party, but there's also this outside agitation that's going to force them to have to move and understand the value of black candidates and black women candidates that will win and can win. I know that was very long winded. Great. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that that was, I'm so glad that you exist in the position that you do, you know, and, and, and I, I feel like I'm asked this question a lot, every single day. Um, Toni Morrison gave us a term uh, years ago called the white gaze, how she doesn't, she doesn't write for, for white people, that she writes for black people, and black, and specifically black women, and that by eliminating the gaze, of, of that work that she could actually write for, for the, and tell the story she wanted to. I call it the democratic gaze. I am not building something in opposition. I'm not building something that is always in response. And I'm not building something that is reliant on their strategy. I, I specialize in many ways in primaries. Um, I'm always, always running against another Democrat. In every race I've ever worked on um, in the last three years of Three Point Strategies, I've always had the party against the black woman candidate that I've been running against or running, running with uh, and working on strategy for. And so I just, I think that it is an institution that I want to be healthy, that I think um, has a lot of power to to um, get us to the progressive future that, that, that black people deserve and require. Um, I'm not building for them. And I don't actually think that the two-party system is one that is um, values-based enough and that can do enough to get black women elected in the, in the ways that we do. And so until I think that we can reimagine what um, this democracy can look like so that everyone can participate, I think I just am going to continue building with black women and black people in a way that they can't deny um, and to keep winning, which is, is all they seem to respond to. Um, so I love the fact that I was able to communicate very early on in my campaign 
with Rootsless and um, meeting with the group, being able to get a lot of like the understanding, like before my whole team was set up and being able to have like these consultations and these conversations with them because they are very clear where they have like a path for building up black women to run for office. And so, um, you know, like they have these brunches where they bring all of these um, women who are at the, at the level that they can run for office to actually think about it. And so one of my first calls was actually to Ruthless. And uh, um, they help kind of guide me through that process of kind of like well, all of the things that Jessica has been laying out around. These are the things that you need to think about. These are the lists that you need to pull together. Have you pulled your phone list? Have you figured out like with the Excel sheet and putting next to people's names, what is the highest amount that you feel that you can request of them because you don't want to start with your bottom line. You actually want to start with the highest amount and then probably negotiate down to what you can get them at. Um, and so um, they were very critical um, to my race. And there were definitely a lot of other women's organizations that I did speak to, but Ruthless was definitely like a cornerstone support for my campaign. And I, I couldn't hear the question, I'm sorry. If, if there was one for me. Um, the question was around um, um, like the different women's um, organizations that are out there that help women politically. And so I kind of mentioned, you know, in Florida, we have similar to Emily's List, we have Roots List, and that's one of the groups that helps women in our state. Yeah. Awesome. And then for anyone else out there, um, Higher Heights for America is a black women's organization that's specifically working with black women candidates, um, um, as well as the Collective PAC, which helps uh, black candidates all across the country. But they will, both of them will engage in the primary process um, as well. And there will be a black campaign school this summer uh, hosted by the Collective PAC. And so I'll make sure that folks get the information as a follow up as well. We last year we had 125 potential candidates and it was just an awesome, an awesome week learning together. So I'll, I'll ask one of the last questions that we had um, where um, and I'll ask this to you, Jessica. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, 2017, we saw Black women voters wield a tremendous amount of power across the society in electing both white progressives, so in Alabama, and um, also other Black women in office holders. And so, is this a temporary or permanent? Um, what will it take to turn this moment into long lasting leverage? Mm. Um, and I love how you, that you just like became Oprah. That was so great. <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome. So, you know, first of all, I think. I'm like, wait, what's happening? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> without us, that's right. It's so good. Um, well, so we, we were just answering, answering one of the questions. Um, so I'll, I'll start and then, you know, you all take it away. It's just, um, you know, I actually think that this is trending exactly how we've been trending. Black women in many ways, when people talk about the black vote, oftentimes what they're talking about is black women. We've always historically over the last 50 years made up about 60, sometimes 70 percent of black people voting are black women. And so, you know, this is, uh, I, I keep joking that 2017 was the year that progressives discovered black women. And I don't just mean to be snarky, but I mean that like literally the data has always demonstrated that when we show up, not only do we show up, we bring our communities with us, we bring our sororities, we bring our schools, we bring our churches. And so, you know, I think that the way to leverage this power though, is we gotta make some demands. So we have to demand that if you're running for office, that you have a diverse staff, that if we if that if you get elected, that you are hiring people from the community, that um, that some of these organizations that are really counting on us as base voters, that they spend money early and often to communicate with us about the things we want to hear about. And um, and so I think that and I would say that we have really made a case for the party. And for other organizations who don't want to get into primaries to get into primaries for black women. We make up 3% of elected leaders across this country. 
Um, there are electoral reparations owed for, for that. And so what that means is that folks got to get more courageous about the way that they say that black women don't need to just be the mules of this electoral system, that we should be the leaders. And that's not going to happen because of black girl magic. That's going to happen because people actually change the process at which they support us. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of institutional things that are required in order for us to actually see the fruits of our labor. Yeah. And I would definitely add to that because I know, I'm having these conversations right now in my community because again kind of going back to the 2016 election and seeing what happened with that and how black vote wasn't prioritized and um you know florida we're we're in a very important moment because we have an opportunity to flip a lot of seats we have the opportunity to gain the governor's mansion after it, it hasn't been since I was probably like eight years old that um, a Democrat has ever held um, the Democratic position um, of governor. And so we're asking and we're demanding of the party that they make sure that there's a very clear plan for how they are engaging black voters and understanding that, especially in a state like Florida, black voters are not monolithic. We all speak in multiple languages. You have huge communities of black immigrants and your communications plans have to represent all of those different communities and how you're gonna reach out to them and it shouldn't be in the last three or four weeks or the last month of your campaign. Um, and so we're definitely trying to figure out what are the ways that we hold our party, um, the contractors that will be coming on board to understand that you have to communicate with all black communities throughout the state of Florida. Um, if you actually want a victory, because we saw in 2016, our people stayed home. And because we don't want this oppositional, like vote for this person because this other person is worse. It's like, we need to vote for you because we actually see the connection between you and what you want to do for our communities and that your values are aligned with us and making sure that our communities are progressing, that our kids are no longer dying on the streets, that they're not being reflected in your policies and your actions or whatever it may be. And so I'm making sure that you actually care about us and not just about this election. Yes, that's right. We both have said the same thing. And it's literally black people have to be involved in anyone's plan if they are wanting to run for office and they're they're trying to become an elected. Whatever plan that is, black people, especially black women, have to be included in that plan or it's not going to be successful at the end of the day. And I'll just add, at, at the end of it, as an elected, again, it becomes our responsibility to ensure that once we're elected, it's our goal to come back, support, as we retain our seats, we, we gain our seats and we retain our seats. Our goal and should be the only focus is to support other women and attain even more seats. That's right. Thank you for that, ladies. And I will say that the information is um, Thank you to our viewers, both through podcast and those on Facebook. We will have this available on the Florida Majority Facebook page as well as our website for those who may have missed it and want to review and we'll take some notes from some of the stuff that was said. Um, we also have some links from some of our partners and friends that could be helpful for those who are interested in running for office, having more questions. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the New Florida Majority is here both in Jacksonville as well as in Miami, Florida, and we can help you. Um, navigate through the system as a black woman or as, you know, any candidate looking to make progressive change in the state. So you can always, always reach out to us. Um, I will say, are there any last words from you, from friends? Um, I think Jessica said something about, uh, and I took it from the keynote, there was one particular thing she said about with someone thinking about running for office make sure they are uh, well aware and they, they stay attuned to the campaign finance law as they change. I'd like to offer my services up to any of our viewers in the elections office for that uh, 14 years. Um, that can be kind of harrowing for someone that don't understand that. So definitely reach out to uh, myself or Jessica or Fran because I think any of us would be willing to help um, another woman of color to gain any type of information they need, right? 
would be to work run for office. So we're open. And she means that because I harass her for a long time. <laughs> 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 <She does. laughs> okay. Any other last words? I just have a really quick last word um, about, I saw a question in the chat about self-doubt. And I just wanna say, you know, we need each other now more than ever. Um, and not just because of this political climate, but because of social media and the ways in which we are often isolated from each other and, and sometimes even pitted against each other. And so I just wanna keep it super real to say that like, we really gotta lean on each other for the support that we need. And, and if you are feeling fears, I, you should be talking to your bestie, talking to uh, you know, Monet, talking to, uh, you know, reaching out to us to get that love and that affirmation that you deserve. And, uh, and also journal. I know this sounds corny, but I write in my journal every morning and every night. And uh, to start to dream about what you want your life to look like and why and why and what's making you mad and what's making you excited um, and to process some of these things um, so that we can be like truly the community that we need. We are not going to go far without each other. And so we really need to lean on each other for that for that support so that we can all get to where we want to go together. Yeah, I mean, and I would say that one of the most beautiful things that helped me get through my campaign was being able to embrace all of me and so kind of like going back to the self-doubt and we as black women we just always feel that we're not good enough we never feel that we are worthy of people's respect of worthy of people's love let alone worthy of representing the communities that we will fight tooth and nail for and so one of the most beautiful things that happened, you know, like when I was in my campaign was being able to embrace all of the parts of me and not being afraid or ashamed to share those parts of me. And because it was always kind of like the, is the media going to get a hold of this and how are they going to spend it? You know, and so it was me saying that, you know, I am a Haitian Dominican American woman whose parents migrated here from Haiti. I was born and raised in little Haiti and I'm the first one in my family to go to college. Um, I am a survivor of domestic abuse. I am a survivor of child sexual abuse. And so I own all of these parts of me because no one can tell your story like you can. And when you step up in front of your community, they will understand that I'm not here for any titles. I'm here because I want to represent you. I'm here because I know we deserve better and that our communities deserve better and our future, our kids deserve better. And so when they hear that and just that sound of like your passion, that self-doubt will fade away very quickly because you will see how many people will come to you, want to support you and stand with you. And that's the most powerful thing is being embraced by people who just want to see you succeed, even when you don't think that you can. Mm -hmm. That's the word. Mm -hmm. Thank you again, ladies, and for everyone who joins us. Um, we will be filling out a link to this um, footage if you haven't liked it, please do, as well as on our website. So I enjoyed this time, and hopefully, we'll be here to see some of your favorites soon. Thank you for hosting us. <laughs> Bye. Bye.